Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to this fine program. We are about to get started. We're going to hang tight just for a couple more. Minutes. We're going to start promptly at two o'clock. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, this is a program by the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Today's topic is on tortoises. My name is Jess Brooks. I'll be your host today. Uh, I do co-host who will be checking in on the question and answer box, which at any point, any anyone participating today can ask a question in the question and answer box. It will be at the top of the box page. It's labeled Q&A. You can go ahead and type in any any question you like. Um, Abby, who, who is my co-host, will be checking in with that and answering questions. Throughout the presentation today, I'll be checking in with the audience. Um, I have some questions for you guys. We'll have a question and answer time set aside. Um, there's also a chat box. Um, which will be at the top or the bottom, depending on how your screen is laid out. And um, you know, throughout the presentation, I'll be checking in with you guys. I'll, I'll have questions, some little activities and such. So um, at those times, you will be able to access the chat box. However, right now it's closed. So before we get started, I wanna thank you again for tuning in. This is a family program and it's rated G. Uh, that means that it's um, only for families and, and anyone who would like to participate. However, there's no profanity or appropriate behavior, or we can um, ask you to leave the presentation. We can also dismiss you from the presentation. So follow along, um, get creative with some of our short activities. And um, all right, let's get started. So, um, like I said, my name is Jess Brooks. I'm going to turn my video camera on just so you can see my face and my beautiful desert tortoise here in the background. Um, I work for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. I love talking about desert tortoises. They are our state reptile. Um, for the remainder of the presentation, I'll be turning my camera off so, I, so you won't be able to see my face, but you will be able to see the PowerPoint and we're gonna be shuffling through the slides. Um, if there are any questions at any time, feel free to go into the Q&A box and um, my moderator, Miss Abby, she can, she can answer those questions. All right, I will turn my video camera off just for a minute and we'll get started. So today we're talking about desert tortoises. Um, first, we're going to jump into some of the basics about what, uh, what it means to be wild, what wildlife needs are in order to survive some fun desert tortoise facts. We're gonna be talking about what makes them special, some anatomy, the life cycle, uh, threats and protections. So we're going to be discussing how, uh, how we can help protect them, when is the best time to see them and how we can help. So what does it mean to be wild, very first and foremost? A wild animal is an animal that does not live with people. It's um, an animal that is not managed or domesticated. So I want you to think about um, what are other wild animals you've seen in the Mojave Desert. That's where we live. Um, is your dog a wild animal? Are desert tortoises wild? And that is sort of a loaded question. We are gonna be discussing that a little, a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, but I did want to show you this picture off to the right. Um, both of these tortoises are domesticated. One is a full grown adult and the other one is a baby. So wildlife needs four things to survive. Uh, think for a moment, see if you can um, think about what they are. They are food, water, shelter, and space. Uh, these four things are necessary for survival. Uh, these four things also make up the animal's habitat. Uh, desert tortoises need other wildlife too to survive. So on top of having food, water, shelter, and space, they also need all the other plants and animals that make up their environment. Uh, these five things make up an ecosystem. So this is a very quick drawing of our Mojave Desert. This is just a very brief 
picture. It does not include all of the other wildlife. Um, today we're going to be discussing more about our desert tortoise and how they fit in. So desert tortoises, their average adult shell size, which is measured front to back, is between 7 and 14 inches. They do not get that big. Um, their average adult weight size is between 10 and 17 pounds. Males are normally largest. And their average lifespan is between 35 and 40 years in the wild and as long as 80 years in captivity. Now, there is a record for this, and I'll be asking everyone later on what the, what the record is. Um, you might have a couple seconds to research it if you want, um, but that will come later. Um, the mortality rate for juvenile desert tortoises is about 98% in the wild. And that's mainly due to predation um, in captivity, however, the mortality rate for desert tortoises is close to zero. So it's sort of like having two different populations of the wild desert tortoises and captive desert tortoises. And lastly, uh, desert tortoises are diurnal. So this is our very first question. I would like to open it up to the chat. Um, the chat is now open. I would like if you could to um, maybe answer and type in what you think diurnal means. So desert tortoises are diurnal, humans are diurnal. Hello. <laughs> yes, the chat is open. Hello, I see everyone typing. All right, excellent. Yes, diurnal means uh, we are active during the day. Beautiful. Nocturnal means we are active at nighttime, and then there's an in-between, which is called crepuscular, and that means that an animal is usually active uh, around dawn and dusk. So desert tortoises are diurnal. So I'll be closing the chat just for now. So what do desert tortoises eat besides cactus? I remember they have no teeth but they do have a sharp serrated beak that helps them chomp down. So think for a moment about what other things a desert tortoise might eat besides cactus. They eat prickly pear cactus and their fruits. In fact, in the picture, this is what the desert tortoise is munching on. They love desert greens, flowering plants, especially in the spring. The soft, newly grown plants is their favorite. Of course, desert tortoises eat water or drink water. <laughs> Sorry, they drink water. Water is normally obtained mostly through what they eat. So a desert tortoise doesn't have to drink water on a regular basis. They can actually store water in a sponge-like bladder within their body and during dry spells or um, a long period of time, a drought where water is hard to find, their bladder can store up to 30% of their body weight in water, urea, uric acid, and waste. So if there is a drought, they don't have to find water right away. Uh, this is another good reason why we should never pick up a desert tortoise if we see one. Captive desert tortoises are a little bit different because they get water on a regular basis and they're used to it. But if you do see a wild desert tortoise, you should never pick them up because they'll evacuate all of that water storage. And if they don't replenish it right away, they could become over dehydrated and potentially die. So what do desert tortoises use for shelter? The obvious is their shell. They also use rocks and bushes. They use burrows that they dig in the sand to escape from the heat or cold or from predators. They can also share burrows with other animals. In fact, during floods or stormy weather, things like that, they can share their burrows with other rodents, even snakes, um, just to get away from that immediate environmental threat. Um, in the winter, they hibernate in deeper burrows up to 30 feet underground, and they'll normally only have one big, deep burrow, but during the summer, they can use multiple shallower burrows, and they'll typically spend around 95% of their time in their burrow. 
So desert tortoises are ectothermic, um, and I would like to hear from you guys. If you know what ectothermic means, I'm going to open up the chat. Go ahead and type in your answers. So what I'm looking for, if I did misspeak, because there are two, there are two words um, that we can talk about. Um, desert tortoises are ectothermic, and I'm opening up the chat to see if you guys know what ectothermic means. If you don't, it's totally okay. I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> um, I am seeing some good answers. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, ectothermic, which is what desert tortoises are. It's also called cold blooded, which means an organism that regulates its own body temperature by exchanging heat from its environment. That's why um, lizards who are also ectothermic will sunbathe on hot rocks to absorb that heat from its environment. Um, the other side of things, endothermic, which is what birds and humans are, are warm blooded and they maintain sort of a constant body temperature regardless of what their environment is. So great answers, everybody. I'm going to close the chat just for a moment until our next question. So uh, we talked about this just a little bit. Mammal birds are warm blooded or, or endothermic. Um, other animals that are ectothermic, snakes, lizards, even frogs. So tortoises also go into brumation in the winter time to escape the cold. Um, Brumation is a deep sleep, not as deep as hibernation, a little bit different there. Um, in the Mojave Desert, brumation is normally between October and mid-April. So while a tortoise is brumating, they may wake up here and there to eat, um, go to the bathroom, move around, get more comfortable. Typically during brumation, um, desert tortoises will grow, which is why it's so important if you have a pet desert tortoise, that the hole to their entrance to their burrow is big enough so that when they go in, they come out a little bit bigger and we don't want them to get stuck on their way out since they grow during brumation. Uh, this picture down here at the bottom left, this is Mojave Max. This is a really cool website that everyone can go visit in their spare time. Um, Mojave Max is the official mascot for the Clark County District of Conservation Program and all of their partners. Um, Mojave Max uh, works to tell folks about native species, what they can do to protect their environments, and how to safely enjoy the desert while walking around. The school district and the classrooms can also participate in um, an, an emergence day guest, and that's when um, Mojave Max will emerge from um, their spring burrow. So all the classes around uh, Las Vegas and the Las Vegas Valley will take guesses as to when Mojave Max will come out from um, its burrow. Okay, so what makes a desert tortoise so special? Here are some of the anatomy that we are going to talk about um, uh, in just a couple seconds. Um, their shell has two parts, the top and the bottom. The top is called the carapace and the bottom is the plastron. They do have scoots, marginals, a gular horn, which is a very special part of the shell. I'll show you where that is in just a second. Um, of course, they have a head, tail, feet, and claws. Now on the right-hand side, that is a picture of the top part of the carapace or the top of the shell. And here's where I wanna get into um, the record for the longest living tortoise. Now, I'm going to give you a hint this is not a desert tortoise, but it is a very long-lived tortoise. Now, um, I have opened up the chat. Ooh, I already see some answers coming in. One more hint. Um, so this wasn't a desert tortoise. It was a radiated tortoise, which is a different species. Good guesses. Sam, I see you guessed 185. That's a great guess. A little older, though. 300, uh, 
Closer, 3,000? No, that's a little too old, but great guesses. Wow, I'm impressed. The longest, here's the answer, the longest lived tortoise was a radiated tortoise and um, she lived to be 226. This desert, or this radiated tortoise, the one that lived to be 226, was presented to the Tongan royal family by the British explorer James Cook. That happened a long time ago. Excellent guesses, everyone. All right, so one by one, we are going to go through some anatomy red squares first. So, of course, the top shell or the carapace. The bottom shell is the plastron. Those are the scoots. Marginals are all the plates on the side. And the gular horn is a fort or a two fused forked um, plates in the very front of the desert tortoise's shell. And it's only on the bottom. Um, but I wanted to see if you guys knew what the gular horn is, is uh, used for. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull up the chat. I'm going to open it up. So um, I'm going to see if you guys know what the gular horn is used for. This part, right in the very front. I'm going to see if I can point it out to you guys. Right here in the very front, this forked little area right here. Great answers. I see protection, eating. Mating, digging, great guesses. They're, oh, awesome. Good job, you guys. So the gular horns are larger on the males. That should give you a clue. It does look like a skid plate on a truck. Great observation, Terry. Um, so the gular horns are normally used in mating and desert tortoises, believe it or not, can be very territorial. So males will typically fight each other and they use that gular horn to lift up other male desert tortoises to potentially flip them over. They can also um, use them to, to lift up the shells of a female to see if she's ready to meet or not. All right, good guesses, everyone. I, I, do, see, I do see everyone's answers in the chat, um, even if they're not popping up for everybody, I will I'll do my best to announce it um, before I open up the chat for everyone. Alrighty, so we covered the shell. Now we'll cover the blue squares, the, the, um, the body parts of the desert tortoise. So number six is the head, of course. Feet and claws, and number eight is the tail, which you cannot see in the back. Their hind limbs and their front limbs are elephant-like and they have really thick, hard scales, which does act for protection. So depending on how large the gular horn is on a male, that can also help with protection as well. I forgot to mention that part. So um, desert tortoise anatomy, really quick, their shell and their spine have a really unique uh, relationship with each other. It is used for protection, the desert tortoise's shell is made from um, a protein called keratin, which is the same material as your fingernails and your hair. And desert tortoises do have bones. The spine of the desert tortoise is fused to the inside of the shell. So I'm gonna bring my laser pointer over and right here where I'm outlining the inside of the shell is fused to the spine. So like in cartoons that we used to watch back in the day, a turtle or a tortoise cannot leave their shell or anything and then come back in. Their shell grows with them, much like our fingernails grow with us. Um, they do use it for protection. And the male and female shell shape is a little different. Not only do males have a larger gular horn, but females will have a little bit of a concave or a, and a little bit of an indentation right here. And that's used during mating. 
Uh, for protection, desert tortoises can withdraw or pull in their head and their limbs. And I do have a actually in a few slides. So really quick, I'm not going to open up the chat, but I wanted to see if you guys could think of what a baby desert tortoise is called. I'm just going to give you a few minutes to think about it. But I'm not opening up the chat for this one. A baby desert tortoise is called a hatchling because after all they hatch from eggs. The temperature, and this is a fun fact, the temperature which desert tortoises eggs incubate determine the gender of the hatchlings, which is a very cool thing. So essentially, um, eggs are laid in a bowl in the sand like an indentation and at lower temperatures, so presumably at the bottom or the lower part of the hole in the ground, most hatchlings will be male. And at the top or the higher temperatures, most will be female. Uh, breeding season is typically in late summer or fall. All the desert tortoises are born with a soft shell. Here's a picture of a little tortoise coming out of the shell for the very first time. Their soft shells um, on their backs can take up to two to five years to harden from the sunlight. Um, that's why they make such great treats for predators looking for baby hatchlings because their shell is so soft. So pet tortoises, um, if you do have a pet tortoise, great job. Um, you are not only a pet owner, but you are also called a custodian. Um, some organizations will refer to you as a custodian. Tortoises can thrive in captivity, but they do require a, a very secure yard to prevent them from escaping. They need an insulated burrow, fresh plants to eat on a daily basis while they're not brumating and access to water and shade. Um, breeding domesticated tortoises is not necessarily a good thing. As we discussed earlier, um, the populations are sort of seen as different. The, there is a wild population and there is a, uh, a domesticated population for where pets are. Um, breeding domesticated don't really promote the recovery of the wild population releasing your pets, releasing your wild, uh, releasing your pet desert tortoises can harm the wild populations by introducing disease. Um, if not, um, if not properly managed, all of those desert tortoises that are born within captivity can escape and then get out to the desert and cause havoc on that wild population. Um, we ask you to never release your pet tortoises and they always have a home in Nevada. So if you are a custodian of a pet desert tortoise and you leave Nevada, like if you move away, you are required to find a new home within the state for your pet desert tortoise. So some of the threats of desert tortoises, um, I am going to open up the chat. We do have uh, quite a number of predators of desert tortoises. So I am going to open up the chat right now. It's open, it's open up to everybody. And I would like it if everyone could think of some predators of desert tortoises. And uh, cars is a good one. <laughs> cars is not on my official list, but it is a threat for sure. And this is a picture of a desert tortoise while it's tucked in, it's pulled in its head and neck and it's retracted its front legs and feet. And this is what it looks like when it's trying to protect itself. Great answers, everyone. I see ravens, fox, raccoons, birds, absolutely. Coyotes, absolutely, yeah. Great guesses, everyone. I'm gonna leave the chat open for just a few more seconds. people. <laughs> it can happen. It can happen. Not necessarily predators. People are not necessarily predators. We don't eat them, but people are a threat. Mountain lions, absolutely. All right. I'm going to go through just a few. Um, we do have ravens and loggerhead shrikes, which are um, huge predators of desert tortoises. Roadrunners, 
raptors, hawks, eagles, falcons, owls. You guys really named almost all of them. Gila monsters, no one named. Uh, coyotes. Mountain lions, foxes, badgers, ground squirrels, even fire ants can be predators. So great job, everyone. I'm going to close the chat just for now. Perfect. All right, so how do they protect themselves? We did kind of talk about this already, but they do use their shell. They do have that tough, scaly skin, and they also have sharp claws. They can also bury themselves when they're trying to escape predators, and then they can also do that to escape the heat, too. All right, here is a, a big overview of some of the major threats, um, and I've linked us, or you, within the circle, because we have the opportunity to protect desert tortoises. So we do have mining wildfires as a big one, overgrazing. Now, when I was talking about the predators, someone did mention people. This is where people would come in with OHV riding. Um, I would just say when you are out riding, just be careful. Disease is a big one, urbanization or also loss of habitat. Predators, coyotes, mountain lions, birds of prey. We did talk about a lot of those. Someone also mentioned solar panels. That was a really great, that's a great one. I wouldn't consider it a predator, but that does, that is a threat to desert tortoises. Agriculture, invasive plants and animals. Um, this also includes uh, pets being released into the wild. And of course, railroads and power lines. So all of these threats are for the desert tortoise, but we can help against that. Um, it is very important to protect desert tortoises. So uh, one more time, I'm going to open up the chat and this could be something personal to you. This could be something that the state mandates as far as laws and ordinances. But why do you think it's important to protect desert tortoises? And I have my reasons. Some are personal and some are because of Nevada state laws. But I wanted to see what you guys thought. So the chat is open, go for it. Why is it important to protect desert tortoises? I agree, they are so special. They are a big balance for an ecosystem. We are gonna talk about that in a little bit. Great job, Lane. Yes, some are endangered, absolutely. And that's, um, that's the wild population. All right, great job, everybody. So very first, they are an indicator species. So the chat is still open. Can anyone tell me what an indicator species is? Yes, Margaret, absolutely right. The health of the ecosystem like a canary in a coal mine. Excellent job. An indicator species plays such an important role in any ecosystem. Their role as an indicator species or the canary in a coal mine can show us if there are issues in an ecosystem or if there is a section or a part of an ecosystem that's struggling the desert tortoise population in that area will also show, show signs of struggle. So that was beautiful, thank you. I'm gonna close the chat just for now until our next question. Alrighty. So other species do depend on desert tortoises for survival. We did talk about some of their predators, but that is part of that balance of an ecosystem. So Gila monsters eat desert tortoise eggs. Ravens eat small hatchlings. You know, they're so easy to munch down on. Their shells are so soft. And reptiles use burrows for safety, especially during environmental stress like storms or floods. Um, they can share their burrows with other animals. Um, what I've got on here is a picture of a Gila monster. And these guys love to eat desert tortoise eggs.
So they are listed as threatened officially. They're state protected. They're also the Nevada state reptile. Habitat protection is crucial. Um, desert tortoises need space to, to eat those greens and to call their own. Um, here is a picture of, this picture was taken in um, Lake Mead um, National Park. National Park, and the fence that you're looking at is only between eight and 13 inches above the ground. Um, what that does for the desert tortoise is keep them inside a protected land habitat area, but it does allow other animals to hop over, climb over the fences. And those holes that you're looking at are big enough for small lizards and rodents to go through. So. Um, the desert tortoise does have that protected land, but all the other animals aren't barricaded within that area. So what do you do if you see a desert tortoise? The very first thing, of course, is to be quiet and calm. Look with your eyes from a distance. Uh, if you remember earlier, we talked about a desert tortoise, especially in the wild, being picked up. If they're threatened, they could evacuate all that water storage from their sponge bladder. And if they don't replenish that right away, they could potentially be dehydrated and then they could die. So don't approach them. This little guy here is a baby. Um, he's about double the size of a quarter, very sensitive, very delicate. Don't touch them. Don't try and feed them. All of our wildlife is perfectly capable of finding food on their own. We don't, we don't need to feed them. Um, and of course, give them space. Um, I wanted to take a break, ask, um, ask to see if you guys had any questions. So I am going to, um, I'm going to leave the chat closed. Um, and I do have my moderator, Miss Abby, who has been answering questions, but I wanted to check back in with her to see if there were any questions that we couldn't get to. So I do see, thank you for all your questions. These are great. So I do see a question from Sam. It says, are they in other states? Absolutely. Um, the desert tortoises are found sort of all over the desert Southwest. We have a really great habitat for them in the Mojave Desert, but they're also found in Arizona, Mexico, California, a little bit in Utah. How do you know how old they are? This is a wonderful question, Sam. Thank you for asking. Um, I'm actually going to go back a few slides if I can. I wish I could go faster <laughs> through all the slides, but I do have a really great picture of the very top of the carapace where you can see the rings. Here we go. So this is the very top view of the top shell or the carapace. And if you look really closely, you can see rings, sort of like rings on a tree. Um, the number of rings on the carapace is sort of like the cross section of a tree, um, where you where in a tree, every year or every winter season, the tree grows a new ring. Um, that this can sometimes give a clue as to how old the desert tortoise is, but the growth depends on the growth of rings depend on accessibility of resources like food and water. So a desert tortoise that has plenty of food, plenty of water, access to everything they need, regularly fed by its owner if it's within captivity, no seasonal variation, no predators, no stress, they could grow multiple rings in one year. And the flip side of that, if they don't have any resources, it's a huge drought season, they're struggling to find food, tons of predatory stress, they don't have to grow a ring. So it's a clue as to how old the desert tortoise might be if you do see one, but it's not a finite answer. I hope I answered your question. Uh, I do see a question that says, do desert tortoises migrate? Um, they do to a point. Um, they do migrate a tad, but it's all relative. 
some desert tortoises can travel a very long distance within a certain time period. Most don't, however. A lot of the desert tortoises that we have here in the Mojave Desert are, um, they're, they're kept within those very short fences. So they are protected and confined to that little um, habitat area. They will travel, but it's not necessarily considered migration because they don't do it every single year. They'll sort of just travel around, find their burrow, roommate in their burrow, and then come out in the spring. So it's sort of a mixed answer. <laughs> I'm sorry it wasn't more clear, but um, some desert tortoises do migrate a very short distance. Most do not. I hope that, I hope that is a little bit better. All right, let me see if I can pull up any more answers. Oh, how long can they go without drinking water? Um, it depends on the resources available. A lot of desert tortoises don't have to drink water directly at all, as long as they get um, enough um, water from the plants that they eat, they don't necessarily have to drink water at all. They can store all that in their bladder. However, if it rains or if they do find a puddle or a pool of water in the desert, they will absolutely drink it if they need to. I do see a question that says, please show the skeleton pick again. You got it. I just have to. Oh, there we go. Here is the the skeleton. How many hatchlings per season? Um, I do have a question from Terry asking about how many hatchlings per season. It sort of depends on resources. Usually a female desert tortoise will lay between three and seven eggs. They are, they are usually solitary apart from breeding season. In fact, they spend so much time on their own the only time they spend with another desert tortoise is um, during breeding season. And then the eggs will be laid. As soon as eggs are laid and buried a little bit, the, the mother will leave the eggs. So the eggs will hatch on their own. They will be um, left. And once they hatch, they're sort of on their own. Um, how big can they be? Um, I'm going to go back a few slides to the very beginning um, because there, there were a few answers to this and I want to show everyone be before just answering them. Um, that, okay, so the average shell size is 7 to 14 inches and that's measured from front to back where the head is to the tail. And the average weight is between seven, or sorry, 10 and 17 pounds. They can live in Northern Nevada. However, it is very cold up there <laughs> compared to Southern Nevada. So um, I would say, unless you have a pet desert tortoise, you probably won't find one in Northern Nevada. They have been known to sort of um, make their way up to the Great Basin and Range area of Nevada, which is the very central part of the state. But for the most part, unless you have a pet, um, you won't find one in Northern Nevada. Um, desert tortoises do, hold on, I have to reread the question. Do desert tortoises crossbreed? Um, that is sort of a loaded question within the desert tortoise wild population, there's really no crossbreeding because they're all the same species. However, if a desert tortoise does come up on a subspecies, say from Mexico or like a radiated tortoise, um, they could crossbreed, but their offspring won't be viable. So their offspring won't be able to make babies on their own. All right, um, I just wanna make sure are there any other questions at all from the audience? I'm happy to answer anything else. In the meantime, I'm going to go back. Perfect. All right, just a few. Thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, if there are no more questions, I'm going to hang out just for a few more minutes.
um, just in case someone remembers something that they would like to ask. I really appreciate everyone tuning in. I hope you learned something. This was super fun for us. Um, we're trying to have some webinars um, during the week. So tune in tomorrow, tune in next week to see what the topic is. Um, thank you so much for listening to me and for um, looking at some of our adorable desert tortoises. Thank you so much. <laughs>